So that was a very polished double act. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'd just like to say before we start properly, I'm, I'm feeling quite powerful again today, as I, as I was yesterday. I um, actually managed to get, um, get to bed at Rees my hour last night, um, unlike my co-presenter. And um, so, so just to say to my colleagues earlier who, who, who said when I walked into the atrium, said you're looking like to me. Um, I'm feeling quite powerful actually, Jim. So um, hopefully this presentation will kind of prove that or not. Okay, so um, from, from beads to Buddhism which is a nice, a nice link here. Um, so, so what we're going to do is, um, again, we're going to kind of sketch an outline, I suppose, and we're going to throw a few ideas out. In great tag tradition, um, this paper was written this morning. Um, so, um, so we're going to see how it goes. Um, right. So it's going to look a bit like this, hopefully. I'm going to talk very briefly about paleoecology. Don't worry, it's not like kind of introduction to an environmental archaeology lecture and thing like that. I'm just going to say a few words about the sort of data that we're, we're trying to play with. Um, then we're going to, Susie's going to introduce the study area in Nepal. I'm going to take you through some details about the landscape and the archaeology of that area. <sighs> Do you know what tag needs more of, people? <laughs> it needs more pollen diagrams. So look, if anyone wants to leave the room now, okay, we are stuck with it. We're going to very briefly, and it will be very briefly again, um, present um, some panological data from the study area. Um, we're going to look at it in a conventional sense, and then we're going to kind of sort of refract it through an elemental perspective, and that's the elemental perspective of the medicine tree. And it's going to pick up, I think, a few themes that, that we've already heard talked about this morning, and then, then some conclusions, hopefully. So, so we're talking about uh, pollen data, panological data, so proxy evidence for past environments. And, and it's, it, it might seem a self-evident thing, but there's actually a lot of theoretical kind of angles come off this if you play with it. And a lot of paleocologists maybe don't always appreciate these angles, but that's another talk. Past environments are not directly observable. We reconstruct them, we observe them through our data. Even when we have kind of landscapes such as this petrified forest, if you will, inside the peaks where you get the remains of woodland, you know, these are not past environments, these are, these are the remains of those environments. So we're always working at that remove with our data. Insofar as I suppose quaternary paleoecology has any sort of theoretical basis or an explicit one, we could probably define this. I am completely generalising, so apologies to any paleoecologists, of which there are a few in the audience, if I'm, if I'm, I'm being unfair. We would probably define it as being essentially positivist and empirical. So what that kind of leads to, I suppose, is the fact that most paleoecologists, and we'll return to this in a bit, will be very happy to talk about their data in terms of ecological processes, succession, and when we talk about people, we talk about human impact. So all these kind of ideas. It's a bit different when we try and play with the sort of ideas that were coming up in the environmental session yesterday. For example, Lisa, I think, yes, in the audience. For example, if we talk about sensorial aspects of past landscapes, what they kind of smelt like, kind of the aspect of being in the landscape in the past, lots of paleoecologists will get very jumpy at that point because they feel it's pushing the data too far. Okay. So that sort of leads to what we might call the sort of paradox of paleoecology. So data we have about past environments, the sort of questions we might want to ask that are kind of coming up in this session. Again, we'll come back to that later. On that note, Susie will pick up on Nepal. Okay, Jake. So Nepal, um, situated between China and India, uh, we're looking at a region called Mustang. It's an old kingdom. Uh, it's literally on the border of Tibet and is very heavily influenced um, by Tibetan Buddhism. It's a landscape of extremes. It has the highest pass in the world. Um, it also has the deepest running gorge, greater than the or greatest deepest north-south running gorge. Um, and this was an old salt trading route um, in the past. It's also very dry, it's very dusty, it's very arid today. Except you do have these tiny little um, areas of oasis where um, it's very fertile, where you can get the water in. But um, Mustang itself has been, because it was a kingdom, um, it wasn't necessarily taken into the whole country of Tibet until quite late on in its history. It had its own um, royalty, it still does to a certain extent, but they are... Um, obviously not considered to be royalty anymore, but there is still a royal family there. Um, but they have remained cut off slightly. 
even today, if you want to visit that area, you have to get a permit to go there. That permit costs something like five hundred dollars for just a week's visit. So they have remained quite kind of culturally isolated. They travel out, but there's been very little Western influence going in. So there's quite a lot of um, traditional cultural elements that still survive. Quite a lot of beliefs um, that are still very much part of daily practice. Um, the archaeology of the area, uh, it's famous, there was a National Geographic article um, a few years back, there are something like 10,000 caves, um, you can just about see in this picture on the left, there are little black dots, each one of those is a tiny cave. Um, we know that they were used for burials about 3,000 years ago, and about 1,000 years ago they started to be used as dwellings and they were lived in, and some of these are very Indiana Jones-ish, you can only get in by using proper climbers, proper climbing gear. There is all sorts of um, treasure-like artefacts in them, so it's quite an exciting area archaeologically, but that has been the focus of it. In terms of other archaeology, there is really very little in the region, some rock art, um, some typologies exist, but, but very few. So there was an um, environmental archaeology study done, a pollen diagram created from a place called Jarkot in Mustang. And what they were trying to do was look at how um, the ideas of human impact and can we start to see human impact on the environment, how that might relate to the archaeology of the area. I'm not going to talk about this in detail. <laughs> Don't worry about the fact that you can't see the names. For anyone who's not familiar with the pollen diagram, the general idea is that all of those kind of columns going across are different um, plant taxa, and then down the side is time depth, with um, the bottom being the oldest and the top being the youngest. But as I say, that's just really for note. So that, um, over here, we've got these kind of this green box. Um, this is showing really prior to the Neolithic that we were looking at a, a coniferous woodland and then in the red block up the top what that's showing is that it's becoming more open and you're looking at dwarf, um, dwarf shrubland type things. In easier to understand terms, again deciduous forest, uh, then after the Neolithic suddenly you have um, open types and this is a uh, bush called carrageno which is one of the uh, pollen types on the pollen diagram. So to go back to the pollen diagram again, um, the original interpretation of it was just to say that it was wooded, there were fires, uh, the fires called landscape uh, destabilisation and then it was an open landscape and the idea is, is that the fires were um, set by people, it's looking at human impact and, and then you have this more open landscape. So we'll leave the um, pollen diagram there for now and we will return to it in a little bit. I'll hand back to Ben. So really, just, just the point to be made here, obviously, is when we, we're talking about pollen data, even the, the presentation, we're obviously using a, you know, a traditional Linnaean taxonomy. The way the pollen diagram is organised is obviously a product of that. Paleoecology is essentially you know, an offshoot of ecology in that sense. And ecology, of course, is quite a, is a, well, a very recent science in many ways. So we're already kind of ordering our data in that kind of framework, if that makes sense. So... What we're going to do now is kind of try and move slightly away from that kind of traditional sort of a Linnaean framework and we're going to bring in the idea of the medicine tree and maybe see how we might look slightly differently at pollen data through a different sort of um, world view, if you like. But first of all, I'm going back to Linnaeus. Um, the first time I went out to Nepal, I went out with a very Western scientific mindset. Um, I've always had a bit of a thing about juniper. It's a long story. Um, but, uh, well, talking of last night. Um, so, yes, um, juniper. Sorry, I've completely lost my thread now. <laughs> um, I, there are two different main species out there, and I spent a lot of my time trying to work out which species was which. And I wasn't really getting very far. So, I decided to start talking to local people and actually asking them what, what, what these trees were called. And then I started getting loads of different names. So I was like, well, they obviously just don't know what they're talking about. And then I was being given the name for juniper, but also that was also being ascribed to cypress trees. But they're different trees and you're giving them the same name. So again, I came away very confused thinking they're obviously just not very up on what, what they're actually using. Obviously, that's entirely wrong. Um, what actually they were doing is ascribing meaning to juniper, depending on the use of which it was being used. And also that will obviously vary in a cultural context and it will vary by the person as well. So you can see here, um, juniper is burnt a lot for um, religious 
purposes. So if it's being used in that ritualised context, it will have a certain name. If it's being used um, in a more medicinal context, it will again be given a slightly different name. So it, this is a far more nuanced way of actually understanding vegetation rather than just describing it one name in itself. Okay, so um, the medicine tree. This is, um, I suppose, if we're looking at different uses of plants, uh, and again, medicine is perhaps one of those uses, um, we can see that within Tibetan medicine, it's a more of a, a holistic way of seeing the mind and body, and this is coming back to some of the ideas that people have already spoken about. Uh, it's a way of thinking about your um, mental, emotional, your spiritual health, your well-being. It's not just about um, your, as I say, your physical health, it's far more than that. Generally, the um, concept of Tibetan medicine is based on Buddhist philosophy and also um, Indian Ayurvedic principles as well. And you will find that this is a picture of the medicine tree here. Um, and it's rather than being a written system of knowledge that's passed on, it's an oral system of knowledge that's passed on, or very much a pictorial one. Um, and this is, again, a cultural idea that not a lot of things are actually written down. Uh, it, it's other means and mechanisms of communication. So this is, I'll go through and explain it in a little bit. So the tree itself has two branches. Um, off to the left, um, we have health, and off to the right, we have disease. We have the three humours within this. So the wind um, is blue, the bile is yellow, uh, phlegm is green. And you can see they're actually in both branches. Um, also, uh, there are three poisons. Um, and the poisons are the roots of the tree. Uh, the poisons are hatred, attachment, and ignorance. And it's the, the humours that are the, the fruits of the tree, uh, and they, they kind of counteract the, the roots. But to be in good health, we have to keep the humours in balance. We have various ways that we can do that, but one of those ways is through consuming things. And it's also quite interesting what you're saying about beads that, and other ways that you can keep those in balance. But I suppose what we're looking at is some of the medicinal things within that. So how do we actually manage to kind of link these two knowledge systems where we have the pollen diagram um, and we have the medicine tree? The pollen diagram is from a very specific area um, of Nepal and it is, it is effectively a single scheme of established and coherently ordered principles, whereas the, like the medicine tree instead is more of a lived world where there are multiple knowledge threads there. Um, it's about different um, encounters and interpretive possibilities that you can use. So it's trying to marry those together. So what we've done is we've taken the oral history um, of this gentleman here. He's, um, he was the royal physician, which is again a very westernised term for it, um, to the king in Mustang. Um, he has now passed away, but his sons have uh, recorded his knowledge. And so what they've done is they've recorded his plant knowledge, effectively, uh, from the same area as the pollen diagram, within reason. So for instance, um, one of the plants that he has is Rumex uh, nepalensis, Shumang in uh, native Nepali. And this, you can see where it says taste, strike, energy. That's coming back to um, the qualities earlier, I suppose, that, that Richard was mentioning. Um, so this is very much known for being naturally sweet and bitter. Um, they also go on to mention uh, the uses and the treatments as well. So we have things like uh, kidney fever, coughs, etc., cetera, um, bleeding, constipation. So what we've done um, is effectively take the qualities that are ascribed to these plants um, and see how they plot out on a pollen diagram. He listed 51 plants. Um, of those, 20 were on the pollen diagram. I was quite surprised at how many were on that. It's a huge amount. Um, and the main things to note are the hot and the bitter ones. I'm just going to mention those very briefly. Okay, so across the top here, um, again, we have uh, these qualities, and each quality really consists of, of two elements. Within the pollen diagram, we have, um, again, just to go back to it, we have uh, hot, uh, and we have hot over on the end there. We only had two that were hot, not very many at all, um, but you can see fire is quite a strong element of it. We had none that were sour and salty. Now, I think there's probably a, um, a couple of reasons for this. That fire element, um, and also that's um, the fire element, are called, um, 
happens in the salty element. Again, I've already said we're on a we're on a salt trading route here. So I think it comes back to looking at more than just the plant knowledge that there are obviously other things that are being used within these systems, such as different minerals, such as animals, etc., that we're not seeing. Um, and we can see that there are very much gaps in that pollen data, but that's where we can start to bring in other things. Also, just to knit back, that's moving forward, um, to the actual pollen diagram. In this very first half here, we only had two of the original um, properties or the two plants from the, from the book, whereas the rest were all in that top bit. So actually, are we looking at here a landscape that's not just about um, human impact, human interaction, but actually is it more of a landscape that is providing other things within your kind of lived system of your philosophy? And in this case, that kind of Buddhist philosophy of um, elemental principles that are bound up within that medicine tree. And does it change over time? Okay, um, just to finish quickly because um, we, we're just running over. Um, so hopefully what, what we've suggested, and again this is obviously sort of work in progress and we're just trying to play with ideas here. So we're trying to kind of sketch an outline of, of an elemental approach to paleoecological data as Susie would say. I think there's various ways you could maybe take this. I'd be very interested to hear people's opinions on, on, on what we might do next. Just another, another um, come back to that shortly. Um, and it comes back to other questions, you know, we, we perceive past landscapes through our data. And that is a very different thing about questions we might ask about how people perceived and understood their landscapes in the past. And we can have a dialogue there, I think. I think if we move away, we talked about this a little bit yesterday in the environmental session. You know, I think we can have a dialogue there as long as we're kind of happy to kind of take the brakes off in terms of some of these limits that we feel we might have as paleoecologists. And again, that leads this idea of the paradox of paleoecological data. Information about past landscapes, the things, the questions you want to ask about people in the past. We need to use that data. We need to find nuanced ways of doing that. And I think maybe related to that might be, I mean, a great thing to maybe, maybe do in this area, but, but to look at archaeological sites, maybe the, the archaeobotanical record, see what evidence there is for how people are using these plants, how that relates to the pollen diagram. I think that might be maybe one perhaps slightly optimistic way into it. And just to finish off very quickly, we talked about this yesterday, I'm not gonna say much, are data ever neutral? When we were talking about this and when we were talking about maybe how we might um, move this work on, we kind of suddenly became aware of the fact that, you know, we're sort of, you know, we, we're going out to, thinking about going out to Nepal, taking cores, um, you know, we're appropriating belief systems of indigenous people. So we kind of got to the stage of almost thinking, well, if we really want to understand how people perceive landscapes in the present and the past. Maybe we need to be talking to people like, like Tashi himself. So, um, and there's another interesting line of thought there, but we've run over, so we can stop at that point. Thank you.